You're watching WJKS, Jacksonville's Emmy Award-winning news station. And now, News Watch Jacksonville. News with Jim McElroy and Debbie Ferrero. Weather with Sharon Graves. And sports from Glenn Fisher. This is News Watch Jacksonville. Jacksonville's on the verge of getting some sorely needed police officers. But the question tonight, what took so long? Good evening, I'm Debbie Ferraro. And I'm Jim McElroy. There are indeed questions tonight that the vote to hire new policemen is, among two other important votes, time for political reasons. Tomorrow is the city's big primary election, and tonight's action in city council could possibly give a boost to some council members running for re-election. Newswatch reporter Jim Pickett is live at City Hall tonight. Jim? Well, Jim and Debbie, as you can see, the council chambers behind me are empty, but they'll be filled a little bit later on. I'd say in about an hour or so when the council meeting starts. That's because some of the most emotional issues taken up by the council this year could be decided tonight. Now, some critics say that's because of the primary elections that are going on tomorrow. Tonight, the incumbents running for re-election for city council are giving themselves an edge over their opponents by voting on some controversial issues. For instance, the hiring of new police officers. Tonight, it's expected the council will approve the money to start a new class of recruits. Not surprisingly, it's being pushed by council president Henry Cook, who is also using this as a campaign issue for mayor, even though he's unopposed on the Republican ticket. Cook concedes that it's to his advantage to act on this now. Another example is the proposed ban on topless dancing in bars. Now, this has been stuck in committee, but now, all of a sudden, it's being yanked out and thrown before the entire council to vote on, despite the fact it hasn't gone through all the normal channels. The bill may have, uh, probably came about because of elections anyway. Uh, there, there's, uh, we're in what I call a silly season. Another election issue being brought up tonight is the new jail. Now, it's a complicated proposal, but in the end, it could decide if non-union or union help will be used to build the jail. But once again, some critics are worried that political criteria will win out over construction criteria. Now, all three issues have been stewing around for months, but it's no surprise that they waited until now to act, even to Council President Henry Cook. It isn't the way to do the government's business. But the only thing about it is that if once you've been given a challenge, then you have the, the responsibility to respond to that challenge. Now, I talked to some other council members who are unopposed in tomorrow's race, and they say they understand what's going on, and they do the same thing if they were up in a race themselves. Jim, Debbie? All right, thanks. Jim Pickett live from City Hall tonight. And council members will be voting on these issues tonight. Jacksonville will be voting on their seats tomorrow. And Debbie, most of the campaigning will go on hold tomorrow for this first primary of the year's big city election. Nearly 283,000 registered Republicans and Democrats have their choice of candidates for sheriff and council seats. Democrats alone get to pick candidates for mayor, property appraiser, and civil service board members as well. Now, the polls will open at 7 in the morning and will stay open until 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Election supervisor Tommy Bell expects up to a 50% turnout. And of course, we'll have the results for you throughout tomorrow evening. It'll be a while before the 3,000 or so workers at NARF in Jacksonville see if they can compete with the private sector for jobs. Uncle Sam has threatened layoffs and cutbacks at the Navy's rework facility. But NARF also got a big boost from Washington today, a new multi-million dollar laboratory. Newswatch reporter Mike Lyon shows us how the lab could make it easier for NARF to compete. The new building at the Naval Air Rework Facility costs more than $2 million to build. It will be the workplace for 25 chemists and engineers using state-of-the-art equipment. The lab will help NARF find better and cheaper ways to repair airplanes. The idea is to become very competitive. In order to be competitive, we're going to have to be able to do those things that the rest of the industry does. So this is an investment, and uh, it will pay for itself in a very short period of time. The dedication of this new building comes at a time when NARF is facing possible job cutbacks and having to compete with private industry for aircraft work. But the employees here tell us they're not worried about it. Employees say if the Navy decides to have NARF and private industry compete for aircraft repair jobs, they can hold their own. I think the jobs here are fairly secure. There's always a possibility we may even need to employ more people. It depends on whether or not we win uh, workload. I think our prices and our, our manner of doing things would be just as, as good and just as cost effective as if doing it with, um, in private, with private industry. Congressman Charles Bennett, on hand for dedication ceremonies, says NARF is a permanent part of NAS Jacksonville and could now be more prosperous. They might actually do better than they did before. They might get more business. It was, might get business that was done by private industry before. NARF officials admit they must still reduce cost and lower overhead to compete. That could result in loss of jobs, 
but right now plans are to ask only for early retirements to reduce the workforce. I'm Mike Lyons, Newswatch Jacksonville. And in his dedication remarks, Congressman Bennett urged NARF employees to blow the whistle if they see inefficiency and corruption so the Navy will work even better. Well, Debbie, there were some people who probably wished on Wall Street that someone somewhere had blown the whistle on trading today. The Dow dropped 52 points, and that's the fourth worst day in market history. Most of the activity was spurred by Texaco's announcement that they were filing for bankruptcy rather than pay an $11 billion bond to Pennzoil. Nearly 13 million shares of Texaco changed hands with the stock ending three and three-eighths of a point lower than Friday. I don't think Pennzoil saw it coming, as obvious by the decline in the price per share. The only way they had to go was bankruptcy, uh, and they threatened it. No one thought they would do it until this weekend. It appears that Pennzoil lost on what some are calling a game of corporate chicken. Nearly one and a half million shares were traded, but the value of Pennzoil stock dropped a whopping 15 and a quarter points by the final bell. And that is roughly five times worse than Texaco ended up. A jury is deciding at this hour if Southern Bell will have to pay a former employee as much as $3 million. Mary Vance is suing the company, charging racial and sexual discrimination and harassment. Vance claims she suffered the discrimination to the point of having to leave her job. The jury's been out since 3.30 this afternoon, but no verdict has been returned yet. Carlos Later, the accused cocaine trafficker who said he had no money available to pay a lawyer, has hired a high-profile, high-priced attorney from Miami. Later, thought to control most of the cocaine traffic in the U.S., has been represented by a court-appointed attorney, Michael Weatherby. He'll now be replaced by Jose Canones of Miami. Weatherby could still be a part of the Later defense team, though, if Later asks for him as an advisor. And still to come on this Monday edition of Newswatch Jacksonville, a bigger tax and a quicker pace. And later, we slow things down with a lesson in a gentleman's sport. The legislature is wasting no time in extending the state sales tax to professional services. The Senate Appropriations Committee is looking at the bill today, and many Capitol observers expect the full Senate to take it up on Wednesday, with the House considering it the day after that. In fact, the measure could be wrapped up by the end of the week, since Governor Martinez is strongly backing the tax bill. Now, it could mean almost an extra billion dollars of state revenue every year. The 65-mile-an-hour speed limit is already law. It just hasn't taken effect yet. That's something trucker Robert Baker learned the hard way, getting stopped at 67 miles an hour. It'll be two more weeks before 65 is the legal speed on rural sections of Florida interstates. It is a gray area at this time, but uh, the speed limit is 55 miles an hour, and we are enforcing the 55 miles an hour until the signs are posted. The Department of Transportation sign shop should start shipping the new signs to local offices by the end of the week, and they should be up two weeks from today. 65 will only be legal, though, where it's posted. Also tonight, the stepped-up rate in which Cuban refugees are flowing into South Florida is prompting another concern this evening, that another boat lift may soon be around the corner. It was almost seven years ago that 125,000 Cubans fled their homeland for the United States. There are indications tonight that we may soon see another rash of refugees. Nine Cubans made the perilous journey across the Florida Straits this weekend alone, 50 so far this year, and it is believed that many others have died trying. One researcher claims that conditions in Cuba are ripe for another freedom flotilla. Well, Sharon joins us from her new weather station when Newswatch returns with a preview of summer. And I'll preview a new play that could save your child a lot of anguish. Many behaviorists are now finding that a lot of adult problems stem from abuse as a child. But it's difficult helping these people because they often blot these traumatic experiences completely out of their conscious memory. A new play opening in Jacksonville shows the terrible price people can pay for that abuse. Something might get me. Oh, my house, cold, furnace, man in white shirt. The healing process begins when you can deal with your secret. 
and stop keeping it as a secret and start uh, reckoning with the, with the past. The St. John's River Hospital is bringing three brass monkeys to Jacksonville later this month. <laughs> It's a story that's played out in real life every day. I was abused probably from birth, emotionally, by parents. Um, I was physically abused, sexually abused by a grandmother. I was um, abused sexually from age around 10 to about 14 by uh, a male abuser, my mother's boyfriend. Faye couldn't remember the constant abuse she endured until age 14. That's when she ran away from home. Then, when she was 35, the flashbacks began. One would be a, you know, the man with a, with a belt in his hand looking like he was going to choke me. Faye's been in therapy for 15 months. She's not finished, but says she's never been happier in her entire life. There's hope. It is not the end of life. Put it in the past where it belongs and let it be a finished thing and go on. The play will be performed at Theater Jacksonville April 24th and 25th with proceeds from the first performance to benefit abused kids. For ticket information, contact Terry Rosen at St. John's River Hospital. All right, Sharon joins us now. She's gazing into her crystal ball, looking at Summer. All she has to do is gaze out the back door and <laughs> Summer's there, right? I hate to say it, but it was almost too hot yesterday. It was hot today and we have yeah. been four days now above normal, which is unusual because last Monday we had a high of 70 degrees. This Monday, what do we have? 86 degrees outside. It's steaming. Certainly is a drastic change. And we do have some changes up ahead, but for right now, let's look at the current conditions. Right now, mostly sunny skies, just gorgeous outside. 83 degrees. The high today was 86 degrees. And as for our humidity, it's still rather low at 47%, and the barometer is reading 30.02 and falling. And as for the winds are out of the southeast now, this is a change at 16 miles an hour, and the air quality today, 55 with ozone. And we are still hanging on to our clear skies here in North Florida. However, you might notice out to our west, we're looking at some more clouds now starting to move into the panhandle of Florida. Although they're moving in, temperatures aren't changing a lot. We still have very nice conditions here around the first coast area. Readings in the 80s, 86 up near Savannah, 80 degrees in Tallahassee, 79 degrees down in Daytona Beach, 82 down there in Miami. A beautiful day for most of the Sunshine State. However, out to the west, they now have a shower in New Orleans with 67 degrees and another shower in Jackson with 67, the temperature dropping from the cooler rain falling. As for the rest of the country, let's take a look at this, and this kind of explains what's going on and why those clouds are starting to move on in closer to the Florida area. What we have is a big storm system producing these bright white clouds, and any time you see these really white clouds, that's indicating some thunderstorms in the atmosphere. And these are topping out at about 60,000 feet. That means severe weather is taking place. And they do have three tornado watch boxes following this frontal boundary all the way up into Missouri as a warm front trails across that area. And then it turns back into a cold front just up there to the north of us. North of us. Now notice uh, here we've got the sunshine and behind the storm system there's sunshine too. So once the system moves through we'll have some very pleasant weather again here. I hate to say this but I'm almost sure it'll be nice here for next weekend like it was this weekend. Oh it's just gorgeous outside. All right, the AccuWeather meteorologists and I all looked at our maps and we discussed the storm system and when we expect it to move through the first coast area. Here's where it is currently. Now, by tomorrow morning, it'll be moving through Louisiana and will be stationed just almost to the uh, Florida panhandle. And by tomorrow evening, looking at about 7 o'clock tomorrow evening, this is where the front will be. So tomorrow, what's going to happen with our weather, we'll start to see a change here. As the system approaches, our winds will pick up out of the southeast and we'll have a few more clouds and more humidity. But other than that, we're still looking at a pretty warm, nice day here for tomorrow. As for the marine forecast, the winds are changing offshore. South to southeast is what we're expecting at about 8 to 18 miles an hour, with seas about 2 to 4 feet. Surf will also be coming up as our winds switch to the southeast. As for the tide times, what we're looking at is a high tide at 8.37 in the morning, a low tide at 2.17 tomorrow afternoon. That's sunrise tomorrow at 7.02 forecast for tonight, a pleasant night in the store, a low of 58 degrees with light south winds. Tomorrow morning, you'll wake up to some sunshine and warm temperatures, readings into the 70s by 11 o'clock, southeast winds at 6 to 12 miles an hour. The rest of the day tomorrow, more clouds than we had today, and it'll be more humid than it was today, with a high that should read a high of 85 for tomorrow, not 75, 85, another hot day in store, southeasterly winds at 10 to 18 miles an hour and gusty. Here's that long-range forecast. Now, as the front approaches, we do have a chance of a shower, and that is included in their 
for tomorrow. A chance of a shower tomorrow and Wednesday. And then into Thursday, a little bit cooler, but still rather pleasant with a high of 78. Still a chance of an early shower. And then just in time for the weekend, we're going to have some sunnier weather and temperatures in the 70s. Beautiful. What I don't understand, though, is we're here we're getting all this summer weather, and half of us are coming down with colds. I know. I've, I still got mine. It sounds like you've got yeah, one. Yeah, Sam has one. Oh, uh, it is summer, weekend. indeed. Still ahead on Newswatch, we'll show you a place where the buffalo is still roaming, whether homeowners like it or not. Also tonight, Fish shows us the WITA opening at Amelia, along with another look at the miracle shot of Augusta. I'm Tom Brokaw. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, Secretary of State Schultz and Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze hold important meetings in Moscow, and the Secretary attends a Jewish Seder in that community. Also tonight, Gary Hart throws his hat into the presidential ring for a second time, his formal announcement today. And we'll have a report tonight on John Hinckley making a personal plea to be released for the holidays. These stories are more news tonight on NBC Nightly News. This just into News Watch. The jury in that racial and sexual discrimination suit against Southern Bell has found the company guilty and has awarded more than three and a half million dollars in damages to a former employee. Mary Vance had sued the company, claiming the discrimination and harassment forced her to quit her job and suffer a nervous breakdown. We'll have more details tonight on Night Watch at 11. A place where the Buffalo Rome heads up our video notes tonight in Pontiac, Maryland, a suburb of our nation's capital. Police had to become cowboys rounding up a stray buffalo that appeared near a housing development. No one really knows where the buffalo came from. And police in South Florida are using an old form of technology to capture drug runners these days. Radar equipment that's dangled from a balloon off the Key West to spot drug running boats. Okay, Chrissy and Martina aren't here this year at Amelia Island, but that's okay. No big names, but maybe the big gun for right now, Steffi Graf. Probably the, the best player in future years will be greatness out of Steffi Graf, as you're right. Amelia Island will come alive this week as the WITA, formerly the WTA, is underway. will run through the Sunday's finals. Now, there'll be two matches tonight in center court featuring Carling Bassett in one and the 12th seed, 14-year-old Mary Jo Fernandez in the other. There were some matches this afternoon. The 10th seed, Stephanie Rehe, defeated Pat Madrone of Brazil, a three-hour match that Rehe won 6-3, 6-7, 6-2. Laura Gildemeister, the 13th seed, was beaten, as was Leslie Allen of Jacksonville, losing 7-5, 7-5 to Isabel Kyoto. Now, if you follow women's tennis, you've probably heard the name Mike Estep. He was Martina Navratilova's coach until December. As Herb White tells us, Estep is now taking to the team concept of coaching. Tennis is usually thought of as a one-on-one -on -one sport, and it is in a game situation. But in practice, it can become a group effort. You know, the team concept has been around for a while. Football, basketball, baseball. But will it work in tennis? That's a good question. Mike Estep thinks so, and so do Elise Bergen, Stephanie Rahe, and Carlene Bassett, soon to be considered the Estep sisters. No, not a singing group, but rather a tennis group with Estep as manager. And what a manager to have. A step coached Martina Navratilova for three and a half years before the two-party company in December. Always anxious to bring out the best in a player, a step has big plans for his new pupils. I think it has a lot of possibilities. I think a lot of other players may go to something like this. It has, it, uh, uh, financially, it has a lot of rewards for both the player and the coach. And uh, I, th I wouldn't be surprised if all other people do the same thing. The concept is simple. Work one-on-one -on -one with the players, allow them to practice together, as well as travel and lodge together. A team concept, one Stephanie Ray, he thinks, will work. I mean, it's really nice. It's like a real support, you know, atmosphere. I mean, when you go out and play your matches, Carling or Elise will be there. I mean, it's nice if you have to look out for some confidence or support, and they're out there and, you know, out there helping you. And, I mean, it's really nice. A step has never bragged about being the Mr. Everything of tennis but he does know a good idea when he gets one. Earth White, Newswatch, Jacksonville. Tonight's matches will begin at 7.30, center court at Amelia Island. Two years ago, Larry Mize was in a position to win the TPC, but he blew a five-shot lead in the final day, finished second to John Mahaffey. Yesterday, Mize might have been having flashbacks to that TPC nightmare when he hit his second shot on the 15th hole into the water, had to settle for a double bogey, a, a bogey on the hole, and drop out of the league. But Mize, playing in his hometown, refused to 
Wilter in his 51st Masters. He ended it with this shot, which will go down as one of the greatest in golf, if not all of sports. 140 feet right into the cup. Larry Mize beats Norman and Ballesteros in sudden death to win the Masters Green Jacket. Baseball Hall of Famer Mickey Mantle has been admitted to a Texas hospital because of chest pains. The 55-year-old Mantle was on a flight when he became ill last night. Officials are indicating Mantle did not suffer a heart attack. He was being monitored in a coronary care unit. Now, Mantle started for the Yankees from 1951 to 68. He was elected to Baseball's Hall of Fame in 74. He leads the American League in home run four times during his career. And in baseball this afternoon, uh, the Cardinals, 8-4 over Pittsburgh, and the Yankees win their home opener, 11-3. The Jacksonville Expos play tonight at Wilson Park. Doubleheader, 635. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. And when we come back, a lesson in refined sporting. Elf here. Look who's teamed up with me Monday nights after Sanford and Son. The gang from Valerie. Hey, it's Alf. I'm interrupting this broadcast to announce my engagement to Valerie Hogan. What? what? That's right, America. Valerie and I are going together now. Her show and mine. Ha! Ah, yeah, Monday nights. Love you, Val. He's kind of cute. You got that right. Mondays at 8, right here on WJKS. Channel 17, Jacksonville. Coming up later tonight on Nightwatch Jacksonville at 11 o'clock in our health report, Dr. Dean Nadell shows us we might do a little soul searching if we're plagued by sleepless nights. And we'll show you how some fishermen will be catching some sea creatures while protecting others. And Sharon has first weather. That's on Nightwatch at 11. I'll tell you one more thing in this half hour. The PGA National Resort in Palm Beach Gardens, they were hitting balls on the ground with clubs, but they weren't playing golf or practicing. The Skylink reporter John Holden shows us tonight the championship round this past weekend had more to do with lawns than links. It's known as America's most sophisticated outdoor sport, croquet. No, not the lawn game we all played as kids, rather the same game grown up, mature, properly elite. The backyard was a very casual game, you know, put your foot on the ball, knock it to the bush. And this has very defined rules, very strict. It's more like chess on grass. It's now, for an outsider watching a game of croquet, it might look easy hitting a ball through a course of wickets before your opponent does, but it's much more intense than you think. Ask any member of a croquet team. Oh, very, very. I'd say it's more intense than any other game I've played. Hey, your mind turns, your brain turns to jelly when you're out there playing. It's a very intense sport. Take the strict rules, for instance. With each 90-minute game, you have only 45 seconds to decide where to hit your ball, and always the strict eye of an official timekeeper, counting. 15 seconds. When the, when the shot clock reaches 30 seconds, I tell her she's got 15 seconds left to play. <laughs> but if you're an outsider to croquet like me, it's best to start with the familiar basics. In this case, just hitting the ball. I don't know. Uh, Jeff, why don't you hand me that driver? I'm John Holden with the New Star Network. Uh, what, what's our insurance company again, Jeff? <laughs> and undoubtedly by now, you have new, noticed in your home, our new home. It's not going to take me long to get used to this. I love this enormous thing we have out here. It's a beautiful new set. But you're going to be spending more time than anyone out here in your new weather station. Yes. It's How wonderful. is it back there? You've got all your equipment? And... All the equipment's back there, and we're just, Sam and I are already enjoying it. A lot of room, too. To well, we got to hear from the veteran over here. What do you think? Well, we got to know each other the last two weeks very closely <laughs> in the newsroom with all this space out here. It's very nice. It was a lot like Coach C, wasn't it? <laughs> all right. Thank you, fun. Coach. All right, and that's our news. Thank you very much for joining us. NBC is coming up next. Join us again tonight at 11 o'clock. In the meantime, have a good evening.